Simon Rattle, welcome to 7.30. Thank you. Simon Rattle, after the trauma of a global pandemic, how strange is it to have been able to come to the other side of the world with 114 musicians and their instruments? Well, I mean, the whole idea did seem a bit science fiction, I have to say. And of course, we had two attempts which were aborted. And so, I mean, now for us just all getting on the aeroplane and being here, this is, was kind of really rather unbelievable. And of course, now that it's just finished, we, can, we can't believe we're going, but it's, it's really been a dream. And you feel how much the audiences have been waiting for this. Of course, it's always warm when you come to Australia. It's kind of a very generous. But this is something different because I think everybody knows what they've been missing and so do we. The LSO's first tour to Australia was in 1966, and that's given the orchestra a particularly strong connection with the Sydney Opera House. The orchestra played there the year before the building was even finished, and you've conducted there on a number of occasions since. I have to ask you, how have you found the new acoustics in the concert hall? Well, it's kind of hilarious, really, because, of course, <laughs> before there was this extraordinary, breathtaking building, and the inside was, well, how shall we say, it was all right, but a bit disappointing compared to the rest. And now the inside has the same kind of buzz and excitement that the outside has. <laughs> Simple things like the orchestra can hear each other. You feel as though the sound is going out. And it's a very particular kind of spritzy sound. Uh, it's very, very live. You've decried the impact of Brexit on the arts because it both constrains orchestras' capacity to travel, but perhaps more significantly, the capacity of musicians to work in Europe. Have any of those issues been resolved? And what does the post-COVID, post-Brexit arts landscape look like in the UK? Everybody in Britain is a very good, I mean, probably too good, at making more happen with less resources. Uh, but of course, we do notice, we do notice all along the chain. Uh, COVID, of course, was incredibly hard. An orchestra like the London Symphony Orchestra only gets paid when they play. They're not a salaried orchestra. They're a kind of wonderful pirate ship in that way. But what we find is that a lot of the freelance players who we used to employ are simply now in other professions. We find that people aren't applying to join us from Europe, because it's an incredibly international orchestra, always was from its inception. We find that less people are studying instruments, less people are going into music colleges, certain instruments are becoming underrepresented. It's a very complicated ecosystem, starting from schools which lost so much of their music uh, in the last 30 years. And we just all worry that we are going to be hanging on by our fingernails in a, uh, in a few years. In a speech in London a couple of weeks ago, you attacked the political ignorance of swinging funding cuts to classical music by the UK Arts Body and the BBC. Did you see some irony in the fact that classical music was such a central plank of the King's coronation on Saturday? <laughs> yeah, look, it's... It's interesting, isn't it? Because of course, oh no, we are there, we are part of the landscape. Um, and of course, when I made the speech, I was very much dealing with these two biggest uh, art supporters in the country, the Arts Council and the BBC. But of course, I mean, make no mistake, these are political decisions. Uh, and these are political decisions that have starved both the BBC and the Arts and the Arts Council. And we have to look that in the face uh, and see what can be done to make sure that the other side of this, because everybody realises how many problems there are in the world at the moment, the other side of it, we still have a living, breathing, flourishing, cultural society. It strikes me, reading interviews with you, that uh, you speak a lot about the qualities of individual musicians in your orchestras, something many conductors don't do. Beyond the musicianship a conductor brings to the podium, there must be an extraordinary amount of people management involved. 
How would you describe your human relationship with the orchestras you lead? Well, I think my job is there to try to make their life easier and better, not necessarily more comfortable, but to give these amazingly gifted people a chance to shine absolutely as well as they can. And there have to be very, very few professions where people have to train to such a high degree, but then have to subsume themselves in the whole uh, of, uh, of the orchestra. And for me, the more people can express their personality and play as they wish, the better it is, because you get then all the intensity that comes from a hundred extraordinary people rather than one person on a box with a stick. You got your first job as a conductor very young, 19. Conducting is an art form that depends on others believing in you. And at the core of that is self-belief and the ability to say, I am the conductor. How did you arrive at that feeling of belonging to the community and of belief in yourself? How did you learn to say, I am a conductor? Ooh, <laughs> I'm, st I'm still working on it. Um, when I was really starting, of course, not everything was easy, but when I look back at it, people were extraordinarily generous. Um, I must have driven them absolutely crazy. But you, know, you do realise you have to understand that, of course, you have an effect on what happens, but a conductor is absolutely nothing without the orchestra. And there has to be a real respect uh, there. That when it works, it's like nothing on earth, because even with people I know very well, as in the London Symphony Orchestra, I mean, there's only a few close friends in there. But with a lot of other people, uh, I don't know a lot of the basics, a lot of the simple things about them, but often I know some of the deepest things about them because we're sharing emotions on stage in a way that's really hard to describe. Uh, and being British, we kind of just tend to either ignore it or joke about it. But it's there and it's one of the mysterious features of this weird and wonderful profession. Simon Rattle, thanks so much for joining us on 7.30. Thank you so much.